graduate students confess to this project on, on pornography, but I always feel slightly embarrassed. Um, I was on a panel discussion with a friend of mine who knew about it some years ago, and we were just talking about, I think it was about the 1990s or something, and somehow she was like, well, if, you know, if you're the sort of person who likes sports, or, or you're the sort of person who loves movies, or if you're the sort of person who has a deep interest in pornography, like Mark, you know, <laughs> I, suddenly, I suddenly felt like a very suspicious character. But I swear it's an entirely scholarly interest. Um, it comes up again. I, I truly want to thank all of the organizers of Humanities on the Edge. Um, I especially want to thank Marco and Roland for the hospitality. I got to see a bit of Lincoln. Thank you to all of you and UNL. It was really a pleasure. Um, and yes, I'll be talking today about reality in America. <coughs> I won't cough again until I <laughs> And uh, the counter aesthetic for this moment. So. In 1950, the U.S. critic and theorist Lionel Trilling published his essay entitled Reality in America. It was the first essay of his book, The Liberal Imagination, a collection of essays which, to his, which was to exert a strong over-influence over the American humanities but especially the criticism and analysis of literature for only perhaps 10 or 20 years, but which exerted a subterranean influence for a longer time, I think, maybe even up to the present day, in some of our suppositions about why art matters. Or perhaps it crystallized a dominant understanding of the role of literature and art which characterized the mid-20th century, after 1945. Trilling's first grand purpose in his book was to declare himself in the service of the novel, not just novels. This characteristic art form of three centuries as a preeminent way of undertaking both political and ethical education, political and ethical life. That meant writing the novel for artists and young writers, but also reading the novel, writing criticism of the novel. Trilling confirmed something that was happening outside and beyond him, as in fact, uh, in the mid-century, U.S. University and the allied media sphere of places like the New York Times, novels really did attain their very highest eminence, beyond anything known previously or since. They became a form of mere religion and acculturation, with the modern and modernist novel at the novel center, from Jane Austen to James Joyce. But Trilling, discussing the novel, also warned that people around him were saying, in 1945, that the novel might be finished, that it might have lost some energy or sense of destiny, that this apex might also be its end, the completion of its progress. And he warned writers and readers not to let that happen, because man, a uh, term of the time, still needed further depth, further thinking, and further belief. Trilling's second great purpose in his book, of course, besides his statements of the preeminence of the novel, was to move his audience's expectations for political thought away from what it had been in the generation prior to his. This is quite well remembered about the liberal imagination. It is a political liberal's critique of political liberalism, especially of the progressive era and the New Deal, or the 1930s, that generation right before his, the socialist temper of ideas of democracy in that generation before World War II. In both of these grand purposes, the essay Reality in America plays its role. And I think the essay expresses, in a half-formed, somewhat offhand way, a very expansive insight. The insight is that what we think of as the real, reality, isn't generally what's right before our eyes, or the totality of things, the imminent world, in all its fullness and diversity. We tend to locate reality, the real, in some particular area of significance or deeper import. This is the sense in which the businessman says to the dreamer or the academic, you need some experience of the real world before I'll agree with you, meaning that there's another style of life, the world of competition and struggle, which is the real one. It is the same sense in which people who traffic in deeper meanings or believe in spiritual values, speak of the real reality underlying things, the kind of order that the practical-minded and the businessman miss. It is Trilling's insight, too, that in America, as Americans,
we tend to think of the reality that matters as the one which produces the democracy we want to see. This reality is what democracy really is, or what furnishes its preconditions, or the terrain on which we should seek for it, or where it should seek itself, where it will find itself, where America will seek its future. From Trilly's point of view, the idea of reality in America that belonged to the generation before his, the 1930s generation, had been basically the poor. Reality was labor, poverty, and brute necessity. The odors of the shop, he said, and the slum. Reality had to make, in its implications, or the sheer force of its awfulness, uh, quote, pleas for cooperatives, labor unions, better housing, and more equitable taxation. Trillin himself argued for an opposed notion of what reality really was, or could be in America, as something that he called mind. It involved the perception of ambiguity, of moral nuance and complexity, and such things as tragedy, irony, and multitudinous distinctions, was Trillin's language. For him, it could be found in the novels of Henry James, for example, or in Nathaniel Hawthorne, when Hawthorne would, quote, probe curiously into the hidden furtive recesses of the contemporary soul. <coughs> I don't think we have to belabor the difference between these two pictures of reality or prefer one option to another. I mean, for myself, I would wind up more in the camp of the 30s, but I respect both. It's the essential insight about the delimiting of the real reality, reality in America, to a narrower range of characteristic experience that interests me and its entwining with aesthetic experiences, as to a revulsion at injustice and poverty can be, in its way, aesthetic, and also the sense that this locating of reality might change over generations. It's important to note that Trilling's ideal is very much inner. It transpires inside the mind, in the subjectivity of a thinking individual, conveyed from one person to another through the medium of the lengthy, silently read, privately experienced modern novel. Of course, the novel, at least, did begin to decline in cultural importance, and a morally educative function, probably starting, really, in the 1960s. And so did other forms of this deep subjective vantage on reality in the arts. Easel painting, certainly, uh, but even action painting, the discovery of uh, Trilling's era, which linked artistic mind and viewer's minds through the purposiveness without purpose of strong inscribed gestures. Think of uh, uh, Jack the Dripper is what comes to mind. Uh, Jackson Pollock, that was just his nickname. It'll be good on Jeopardy. Um, psychoanalysis, too, loses its place after being master discourses, a master discourse of mid-century. Certainly novels or paintings or symphonies are only one of the places that you go today when you specifically decide, as we say, to have an artwork change your life, or as we say after the 60s, to have it blow your mind. But these don't actually furnish, I think, the bulk of the significant aesthetic experiences which we have today. Though we continue to note these moments, when we go out of our way to seek an aesthetic experience with life-changing possibilities, and it's appropriate that we're discussing this in an art museum, uh, the kind of primary temple to it, right? they may no longer be the real space of the aesthetic for us. And certainly they're not if we judge the force of aesthetic experiences by quantity or frequency. They have no preeminence now. A common explanation for why the novel is no longer preeminently significant in the way that Trilling and his era wanted it to be is that it was challenged by rivals, rival forms of representation. Specifically, the classic candidate is the movies, or cinema. Then television, billboards, uh, commercial iconography, what people describe as the rise of the image, the decline of the word. And this is also a way that people in the 1960s, at the start of the change, were able to think about and worry about the changes in the arts and culture of their times. In a model of the supersession of media, or genres, or art forms, one by the next, that we still have today. Reading was replaced by radio and silent movies, radio replaced by sound movies and television, movies replaced by television, and everything, lately, replaced by the internet. 
That's, I think, not quite right, of course. And the defect in it isn't just that we still have all of these different media in use today, as people often know. Books, radio, cinema, television, and the internet simultaneously. I think that the threat from cinema, especially, was a kind of red herring all along. There's some truth in the fact that each medium challenged the ones previous, shifting their use or significance, diminishing their eminence, let's say. The problem is that from the 60s forward, there was always a central line of film that really was committed to the same experience of depth and thought, of a subjective vision that belonged also to the novel. Think of the directors who found their self-image in their way of entering the auteur theory, of the European filmmakers of the 1960s and the Americans of the 1970s. Anyone made fun of by Woody Allen in one of his films is, is of oh, that moment. <laughs> Movies in their most celebrated forms never really threatened the worldview of the novel. They reinforced it. Likewise, there was a dimension of television, too, a more, uh, a, sorry, a more different medium is what I, uh, what I wrote in a way that followed this same novelish line in continuity, except that it was importing not the novel to television, but theater to the new medium, whether drama and tragedy, or at worst, a kind of farce or boulevard comedy or vaudeville that would have been familiar before. Again, what's now often called scripted television never really threatened the modern aesthetic that partisans of the novel would have valued. At most, it might have taken more of uh, their time away from rereading Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov or Henry James's The Golden Bowl. Even today, the current craze for HBO series watched on DVD, which are essentially serial films, remains a kind of red herring, a marginal effect, for people who want to believe that the basic continuity of the serial novel and then the cinema and now this filmic television is furnishing us really new instances. Hence the obsession uh, in English departments across the country with The Wire, uh, a truly great show, but I think really only another small modification of this long combination of the social novel with cinema, within now a particular economic structure of a changing film and television industry. This line of authored work didn't necessarily put forward an altogether different regime of experience or a different basis for thinking about democracy, in short, it did not register a new or different aesthetic. But I do want to say that there was an altogether different regime of experience and representation which did threaten the modern aesthetic. It comes from elsewhere, and it had been hard for a long time to pull into view. It's easier to see only now, or in the past 20 years, as it has accelerated or attained a kind of Jupiter-like gravity. This alternative regime of representation making and representation experiencing sometimes even travels specifically under the name of reality. Reality in the sense in which we use it in naming just one of its manifestations in what we call reality television. Actual reality television, from cops to the real world to Survivor to Project Runway to Jersey Shore, is only one portion of the vast spectrum of objects in this aesthetic regime, most of which don't transpire on broadcast television. Other of the key objects might include the turn from novel to memoir as our popularly dominant form of emotional and educational literature. Uh, I think of the writer Vivian Gornick, who pointed out to me that 40 years ago, if you recounted a unique experience at a dinner party, someone inevitably would turn to you and say, oh, you should write a novel. Whereas now, if you recount exactly the same extraordinary experience at a comparable dinner party, uh, someone will turn to you and say, oh, you should write a memoir. <laughs> and the realness of the memoir seems the major change from the novel. The art, the craft of it, is essentially often the same. Another object would be the long survival of what in the 1960s was called the new journalism, uh, which has engrossed many of the best energies of the novel, but working upon real material things reported. A more central one now would be, however, the explosion of online pornography as one of the most prevalent, I think, genuinely, genuinely aesthetic forms that is changing the entirety of the aesthetic universe, is actually changing the arts, and which we just don't talk that much about aesthetically. We tend to just have moral debates. But it matters that the persons in pornography actually exist 
that they were or are real. And we don't think of them as playing characters when they're in porn, even if they have porn or stage names. You can add to this a documentary turn in cinema, uh, and YouTube and live streaming probably are much more significant. Now, silly or minor as it can seem, reality television may actually be a, a paradigmatic or mature genre of this mode. Uh, it's certainly the easiest one to talk about in order to see some of the major features, I think, of the whole thing. In part because we do value the visual and the camera captured so highly. A model that pulls the general phenomenon into the open for analysis. We know that reality television isn't real, as people like to say, uh, because it is plotted, edited, sometimes quasi-scripted, uh, shot and reshot, sometimes just deceptive in its presentation <coughs> of the circumstances, and the scenarios are highly uh, artificial, to say the least. But those kinds of issues of loosely epistemology, how we know what's going on in these shows, uh, also, I think, aren't ultimately really why we persist in calling it reality TV and feeling that that's not just the wrong name. Reality in this place, I want to argue, means something slightly odd, even counterintuitive. The definition of this reality, what I want to say it has come to mean with increasing strength from the early 1960s to the present, would be something like the following. Reality, now, that which manages to be recorded or broadcast by dint of its own energy and fascination from within an individual personality, but also a collective life. What has been most impossible uh, for criticism to accept, I sometimes think, is that it is the pressing into being recorded, the pressure into registration, that orients this kind of reality, which forbids its integration with our ideas of the artist, the filmmaker, or even the culture industry. To accept this concept requires some reflection on the camera's automaticity, this was Stanley Cavell's word, in his great book on movies, The World Viewed, as the feature of the photographic condition that strongly conditions how we experience it. Automaticity rather than montage in film, or in photography rather than the doctrine of the perfect moment. It's our sense, I think a truly ineradicable sense, that when you're looking at a photograph or watching a film, you know that this thing was not drawn, it did not pass directly through any mind, it actually came in only through a kind of automatic device, the camera. And this conditions our way of understanding who or what is actually making the film. It may be wrong to feel that actors make movies, we know they're not alone, that John Wayne makes a movie starring John Wayne, or Tom Cruise ontologically produces a movie starring Tom Cruise, like an <laughs> emanation from his, uh, his small but, but dense body. Um, but I think it's actually almost irresistible, and maybe it's the true experience of films as we have them. The auteur theory was an ideological attempt to argue us out of this folk mistake. I don't think it really worked. And there is a way in which it is even more irresistible to feel that, for example, Snooky is the author of all snookiness on the Jersey Shore, whatever we know about how these shows are produced. Her genius as Snooky makes reality. The thing that manages to make itself real, of course, is that which not only somehow forces itself into representation, but also forces itself into comparison, into our need or our assent to compare or index itself, sorry, index ourselves to it without it really becoming art, without it really becoming fictional, and without shifting authorship to someone behind the camera. It is signed by the person who lives it, or experiences it, with whom we reckon directly. And I actually think if you can, I mean, you may regret this, but if you can fix Snooky in your mind, <laughs> and what it is about her that is so watchable, how it is that she becomes that show, I think you begin to feel that we are not watching something that works the same way as other kind of uh, scripted TV, but also that we're not just saying like, oh, this really happened. And actually, the snooky quality is different. <laughs> I think, importantly, uh, because it's a different principle than what criticism argues with fiction or film, we reckon with all that forms the work of reality, not just in the mode of reception and thought and self-scrutiny, which implies suspension and one conception of the ethical, 
but in a mode much closer to constant legal and ethical or procedural judgment, constant judgment. I think this also explains how one feels about Snooki uh, when actually watching her behavior. We may be like talent show judges, deciding who is a better singer or dancer, or we may be more like criminal court judges, ruling whether someone has done right or wrong in watching the range of things we think of as reality. In an article I wrote about reality television, specifically a few years ago, I argued that judgment, rather than fantasized identification or perverse voyeurism, was the meaningful activity that we should find in reality television. And to push the stakes of this a little further, I noted that the modes of judgment dramatized within reality television may even be closer to the forms of judgment associated with real politics, specifically democratic mechanisms, uh, more so than those sorts of meditations in fiction or film, which people sometimes say are preparatory or propedeutic to politics. One of the only places you can actually see voting occurring within the mass media <coughs> is when contestants get voted off the island in Survivor. This kind of reality, so despised by so many who value art, is the part of mass representation that brings back in, although perhaps just as a bad compensation or parody, the formal features of democracy and self-government. You see courtrooms, Judge Judy, voting, survivor, drawing lots, survivor, and of all the shows, primarily talk, first as a monologue, but then as debate and negotiation. Within reality television, the different devices of genuine procedural democracy resurfaced, which had not really been seen on TV and were not necessarily thought to be part of its nature. In game shows, nobody gets to vote on whether or not you're going to win with a spin of the wheel, uh, the cruise ship cruise. Somehow, in these shows, people participate. Now, in the time since that article on reality television, I've been much more concerned to get back to the deep category itself. This reality as a kind of irresistible registration within mass media or the popular arts by a superior glamour, as we used to say, or splendor, magnificence, charisma, but also in the life of groups or people together by something like the event, a moment of collective realness and registration. And of course, one does have to ask what this has to do with democracy at a moment of its seeming foreclosure within many of the traditional forms of representation and the republic, something that one, I think, can feel in the present presidential campaign. Uh, it's very hard to imagine that each of us is in, in any way being heard, um, except through our donated dollars. This comes as part, for me, of a much larger project, to try to say what a counter aesthetic would look like, one that focused on the most frequent and most plentiful experiences of representation and art, those that are exiled from the philosophically aesthetic realm, or compromised or ignored because they do not fit within the existing models. And if ordinary aesthetics, what we have, were confronted with this counter-aesthetic, not replaced by it, but confronted, would it allow our ways of understanding representations and artworks to expand, to give us a thinking purchase on more of our actual collective life and experience. Now, it won't surprise anyone if I say that the philosophical aesthetics we do operate in currently comes from Immanuel Kant and Kant's third critique, the critique of judgment. If you ask where Trilling's aesthetic of the novel as means of moral conditioning within the play of mind comes from, it very clearly inherits Kant as filtered through Schiller and others. The traits of the aesthetic object in the critique of judgment, famously, are its disinterestedness, its lack of any particular sensuous quality uh, or sensuous commitments to the actual existence of the object behind the picture for the person who views it. Right? So to make this make more sense, if a picture represents a horse, you must not think, that would be a good horse to find in real life. I would like to ride that horse, right? Or the attention you pay, and thus the object, become unesthetic. A beautiful painting is no longer, as it was in, in parts of classical aesthetics, the convincing picture or imitation of the most beautiful person. Rather, the form of the object engages your aesthetic attention. The art object communicates a sense of purposefulness 
of agreement with some hypothesized higher mind or end without being uh, reducible to any particular purpose, the way that Kant says we feel also about nature. The ideal Kantian object of aesthetic contemplation might then be an arabesque figure or a representation of curling ivy. And what Trilling inherits is essentially the idea of the, uh, sorry, the free play of the cognitive faculties in the presence of the aesthetic object. Uh, that is at once subject to judgment and our claims of universal intersubjective validity for the worth of this thing. Everyone must see it as beautiful. Everyone should. And also connected to pleasure and all the ways in which we do differ as sensuous individuals. The free play of the mind in a situation of interior expansion and self-recognition. And one knows, too, that Kant insists on his aesthetic philosophy, or his mapping of judgment, as the work that can link the natural sphere of cognition and understanding with the moral sphere of desire and moral reason. As if aesthetics would help to bridge, to put it crudely, fact and morality, the is and the ought. Although it is never entirely clear how Kant does this, uh, Hannah Arendt, for one, took this work on judgment which she put at the center of her own philosophical system to offer Kant's real thinking and work on the sphere of politics, much more vividly, she says, than in his late explicitly political essays. There are many reasons to wish to expand upon Kant or to challenge this aesthetics, often abused as formalist, and especially the things that he gave rise to in the centuries since. One of the most important challenges for the connection to politics came from Pierre Bourdieu in his book Distinction with what he called his vulgar critique of pure critiques. Essentially, he charged that the removal of the merely sensuous, the interested, the test of whether an art object would be better if the thing it depicted really existed, actually possessed an economic class function as a way of drawing a division between the bourgeoisie those who exist without experience of scarcity and mystify their role in the making of things, and who, who can thus afford to dematerialize, derealize the world, and the working classes, those who are within the exploitation of production and need things, want things, experience scarcity. Right? If, in fact, you work and you labor and you make things, and it so happens that you look at a picture of Picasso and say, that actually doesn't look like anything in my world, this is not a sign that you're spiritually deficient, Bourdieu would, would point out. And that's, that kind of idea is the whole problem. Bourdieu's charge was that the exaltation of the disinterested judgment of taste becomes political in a bad way, as of facing politics, here domination and distribution, with a turn to the supposedly inner, the characterological, the spiritual, I am the sort of person who can appreciate Picasso. Therefore, I deserve my Porsche whatever the, connect, the vulgar connection. My own focus comes through a different challenge to Kant, although it is also one that's vulgar, which is to say, reintroducing the legitimacy of the people, of widely spoken languages, whose value is that they are widely spoken. My goal, again, is a counter-aesthetic, ultimately expansionist, and not a replacement or an anti-Kantianism. My question is, what happens when you do add, or at least respect, an interested aesthetic, understanding it as another aesthetic available to the people who do also participate in the beautiful and the sublime in Kant's sense. But what if, in addition to the beautiful and the sublime, there is also an aesthetic experience of the real, the real in an aesthetic sense, I should say, not a metaphysical one. This is not about what does and doesn't exist. But my larger project is to try to say what a counter-aesthetic might look like in many dimensions. What if philosophical aesthetics would be that ruled in as the ground of properly aesthetic experiences some of the regimes of representation and contemplation of representations, whether we want to call them art or not, I don't always care, and the strong feelings and indeed cognitive practices and perhaps political cultivation which go along with them. In order for that not just to sound like bluster or an empty promise, there's always the worry when someone tells you my grand project is X that they haven't actually started it. Um, I want to move away from this aesthetic of reality entirely to focus on two classes of representation and aesthetic experience, which I think we rule out 
but which seem to me truly fundamental to what we spend much more of our time doing in practices that we would want to identify as engaged with the aesthetic or artistic in our time. And these two uh, additional categories are repetition and emulation. I'm going to try to quickly map out what they would look like in addition to that other version of reality. This line of thought begins for me uh, with a recognition or intuition about what it's like to live in a world of so very many people who now have the power to come into representation, to represent themselves as existing, to record themselves. This is the intuition that we may live at a moment when there are more persons, visible persons existing, than there are distinct personalities to go around. Uh, this has haunted me for about as long as I have had access to the range of mass media uh, since childhood, and I, I hope that other people feel this problem too. Um, I've been troubled for nearly three decades by a trivial lyric from 1988 by the singer <coughs> Edie Brickell. Do people remember Edie Brickell? Yep. She was really something, and her career was cut short when she married Paul Simon. Um, <laughs> it's, one of those, it's one of those permanent mysteries of, of art. Of what, what could it have been? And the lyric goes as follows. This is the part where I sing. <laughs> Somewhere there's a person who looks just like you do, acts just like you do, feels the same way. Somewhere there's a person in a faraway place with a different name and a face that looks like you. Uh, this, is this has been bothering me for 30 years. Um, <laughs> This strikes me, actually, as one of the intuitions of the late modern moment that must be reckoned with. Uh, there are other me's out there. Other me's, in terms at least, of face and name, the elements that are supposed to sign us as unique, since the scholastic philosophers. Now, of course, in an era of Google, you really do learn how many other people there are out there with your name. Many of them aren't even on Facebook. Um, it's hard still to find out who shares your face. Uh, but it's possible, I think, that crowdsourced tagging and facial recognition software uh, should take, a, uh, take, take care of this quite soon. I, I really, I think the day is coming when we will discover who our doppelgangers are. This used to be, it was a, also a feature of my childhood. I was once stopped on the subway in Boston by a man who said, um, no, I don't want to freak you out, I don't want to freak you out, which is, of course, a sure sign. <laughs> He's about to freak me out. He's like, I just have to tell you, you have a double. And he handed me this sheet of paper that he had just written out extensively. I mean, it must have taken him a long time. And he ran off the subway, and it was entitled Your Double, and described a, a young man who lived in Connecticut, um, and apparently looked and was exactly like me in every way. Um, and to my satisfaction at the time, uh, had a, his own radio show called The Art of Noise, uh, which meant that he was like a much cooler individual than I was. <laughs> and so I was like moving up um, in my doppelganger. Now, I remember that during the age of popularity for the television show Friends, I would meet someone new and be able to detect in his or her gestures, ways of telling jokes, and it really seemed whole way of approaching life that he looked suspicious, well, that she looked suspiciously like Rachel or he looked suspiciously like Ross. I think there is something not entirely trivial in the way during the period of uh, success of Sex and the City that people would ask themselves, if they were more of a Carrie or a Samantha. Now, in a way, of course, this is actually insignificant. Uh, we're not new, this comparison, and I don't want to overdo it. Um, character types, characterology, and so forth have existed for a long time, and is, I think, not really the core of our aesthetic experiences. Uh, Saul Bellow once wrote that in Paris, even the waiters will end an argument by saying, well, yes, we have to disagree. You're more of a Descartes, and I'm more of a Pascal. The fact is, though, that larger parts of our lives, as people who can represent ourselves, are still primarily lived in watching, in fact, being totally environed by represented others. The people who are on the TV in the background uh, when you're at home, or when you're in the airport, or when you're in a bar or a restaurant, or now even when you get into a taxi in New York, there are little people talking and dancing in front of you uh, on the, the wall in the back of the seat. Um, we can represent ourselves, but I think we live aesthetic existence very heavily through emulation, through, in one way or another, imagining ourselves as dominant represented others, the stars, 
um, but also engaging in particular practices of emulation. I think this is something that actually goes beyond and is different from what we usually talk about as identification. This, I think, is aesthetically significant in a way that we have not adequately accounted for, and all the more so, perhaps, when you can represent yourself, when your picture too is in some way on the internet, or when you know there's some possibility that you will get the call to be on Oprah. Um, the possibility of being broadcast yourself makes the emulation of the screened or broadcast star less implausible. For me, for example, popular music in all its forms has probably been the major aesthetic experience of my whole life, and it is not accounted for very well by much of our current philosophical aesthetics. It is songs that I knew earliest, when I was still in the cradle, practically, from LP records. It's popular songs that repeat constantly in my mind now, and with songs, the feature of plurality, or superabundance, is paramount. You carry thousands of them in your head, not just tens. And you encounter the aesthetic object, the song, not once or twice, but a hundred or even a thousand times. With the sensation, I think, that it remains the same on some listenings and changes on others, right? The lyrics actually change. Uh, maybe we have an explanation for that, but. Um, you can learn new things within it. A major reception practice of the popular song <coughs> is to sing along. Here is a form in which you actually reinscribe portions of each work's content, lyrically and musically, either in the world, in the shower, or just in your head, almost any time you encounter it or undertake the aesthetic experience. What does it mean to actually say the words of a song over and over? I mean, these are intelligible words, right, with meanings and implications. I know for myself that the lyrics of popular song become a way uh, for some inner me to communicate with myself, even when I don't know what it's saying initially in daily experience. I will meet someone new, have a really nice conversation, and only when walking away, suddenly stopping to listen to the song that has been playing somewhere in my head, realize that that song is You're So Vain, and therefore I learn uh, that what I actually thought of the character of the person I met and I thought I liked was that in fact this person was a narcissist, uh, was vain. And this happens quite a bit. I would also say, as long as I'm admitting the most embarrassing things today after E. Raquel, uh, that a significant part of my aesthetic experience of life, I would insist, was shaped by the fact of re-singing the lyrics of Jim Morrison of The Doors, while also having in mind who this star, this person, Jim Morrison, in quotes, was and of imagining myself within the persona of this Jim Morrison while singing those lyrics, and knowing that the lyrics themselves came from within the total persona, Jim Morrison, a kind of Baudelarian, three-penny opera, Southern California fiction, also made up of the music of Ray Manzarek and Robbie Krieger. And yet knowing that Jim Morrison was also a man, embodied, and inscribed on film, where one can see a quite vulnerable human the flesh that enacted the persona. It is even the case that, at key junctures of my life, which themselves felt simultaneously aesthetic and ethical or political, in deciding what to do or what risk to take in action, I have said to myself, what would Jim Morrison do? <laughs> it seems to me that to keep all of these elements out of what aesthetic experience, as of songs or of pictures, does for us today, <laughs> would be to, to actually fail and have to acknowledge we were failing to get at what actually goes on in the face of an art object. We know that repetition and emulation in these ways are disvalued in comparison to the unique and the authentic. Yet we also know that many of the strongest of our organizations of rebellion in life, ones often oriented to aesthetic experience, involve an extraordinary level of emulation of those with whom we wish to become rebels. Almost all of the major youth subcultures in the US in the period since 1945, black hipster, beatnik, hippie, punk, goth, emo, etc., in some way orient themselves to popular music as their fundamental experience, their basic aesthetic ground. But all such subcultures, as has frequently been noted, also adopt forms of dress and manner which seem astonishingly and recognizably cohesive, not to say conformist. People sometimes frame this as a paradox of conformist nonconformity, 
Sometimes this is even used to disillusion people about the potentially resistant quality of youth subculture. I think it may be more meaningful to say that here we see one kind of extreme of the ways in which it is emulative behavior, repetition and copying, that produces and allows real rebellion or resistance. Anchored though within aesthetic experiences or an aesthetic regime, here again, primarily popular music and songs, just as it is impossible to imagine punks without the music, punk rock. But also in some uh, subcultures, like those of skaters, other arts, the arts of video and self-videotaping, photography and self-photography, you could also say apparel and gesture, which are essentially about the opportunity to picture yourself as another already pictured person. I think it may be necessary to cut the tie that has bound authenticity to uniqueness or only oneness, to ask what authentic emulation can look like. When I was growing up in proximity to Walden Pond, there was a man who would come in my teenage years and impersonate Henry David Thoreau. Uh, he did little tours of the pond, some of which I took, but he also really tried to live as Henry David Thoreau for the summer months. Uh, an exemplar of American authenticity and withdrawal, of an insistence on the authority of the self alone in the face of conformity, uh, but, you know, just for June, July, and August. <laughs> um, and it was quite striking to me that this did actually seem like a way to live deliberately, to truly embody the kind of independence not much evident in day-to-day -day society, and that perhaps, as for him, sometimes it could only be attainable by impersonation of which this was admittedly an extreme form. It was interesting to learn when I asked where he spent the rest of his year that he taught at the University of Las Vegas. Interesting, too, that these summers came to an end uh, when a second person appeared on the scene who was himself also a Thoreau impersonator. Uh, it did not seem possible to anyone that there could be two Thoreaus at the same time wandering the shores of Walden Pond, so there was an unexpected limit. <laughs> I think it would seem to need a counter-aesthetic to explain this. Counter to the aesthetic that is based only on individuality as uniqueness, an association that may be, as the computers say, a fatal error. You would need an aesthetic for plurality, one that addresses the incredible quantity of representations in the world through the triumphant quality still of just a few. An aesthetic that can address the asymmetries of production and reception where we take our representations from, or who we take them from, in what quantities, with what seriousness, <coughs> when we can't enter into them ourselves, and when, much more rarely, we can. And to try to undertake all of these things without naively believing that this upsets the fundamental asymmetries of power in representation. Fundamentally, it's still those who have the full bank accounts that get to make almost all of the kind of uh, representational or even artistic objects that we see day to day. An aesthetic, finally, that moves beyond the question of conformism at all to acknowledge two things. First, the strong intuition that, yes, there is a kind of stupidity and enslavement that can occur before widely enjoyed representations of all kinds. Uh, but that even those of us, sorry, also that even those of us who experience and enjoy representation created by the culture industry shouldn't stop believing in the culture industry and its baleful powers. I am not an advocate of any and all representations or their resistant functions or the reception regimes that accompany them. But I think there must be a strong intuition, too, for anyone who has experienced this in the post-1945 age, that repetition and emulation with an ultimate art reference define the strong rebellious programs and the main reminders of rebellion that get organized from below. In counterculture and subculture, and also that they may define many of the most fundamental experiences nowadays of self-making, cultivation, cognition, and judgment associated with the aesthetic. <coughs> now the second thing I was going to talk about, and the final one, I was going to end with how all of this helps us to understand Occupy Wall Street. But it depends on time, yeah? <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. I want to end for a moment by talking about Occupy Wall Street as a genuinely political experience of a kind that I had not experienced uh, before in my lifetime, but one that partly transpired within some unfamiliar regimes of representation, uh, which it is easy either to overestimate or underestimate. The important thing is to note them, I think, 
to know them in public, and open up some time to think about them before we just assimilate them to our preconceptions. And already, I don't know if people have looked at any of the books being written about uh, Occupy, but it's very interesting because you can see people trying to come up with an account that everyone can agree on on what happened or what it meant. Two features striking is worthy of noting in relation to the discussion of possible elements of a counter aesthetic, such as the feeling of reality, emulation, and repetition. One of them is the famous human mic. This was the feature that developed out of a prohibition on loudspeakers or amplification in Zuccotti Park, but became an essential technique emulated by many occupations. Uh, it was the means by which people, anyone at all, uh, could speak in the General Assembly. As the person spoke, his or her words were repeated every few words by others in the group, so that people further back from the speaker could hear the words too, which otherwise just wouldn't have carried over the distance. Uh, but the effect was really that everyone usually repeated back the words of each and every speaker, right? And so this was the, you know, someone would say, Mike Jack, and I'll repeat Mike Jack, and the person would say, My name is Mark, and everyone would say, My name is Mark, and it, you know, it was a slow process. Um, now, at first exposure, many people found this weird, verging on scary. Uh, because, you know, it's our basic idea of tyranny or political uh, total conformity to have a group mouth the words of a leader, whatever those words might be. People who have discussed the human might stress, on the contrary, the fact that, of course, anyone could speak in the assembly, and it felt to people participating, and this is really true, as a kind of amazing experience of taking in people's words and having to really hear their arguments, whether you liked those arguments or not, in a way that undid the perpetually summary and adversarial style of so much other political discourse in America today. That's all true. You did have to actually hear people in a different way. And yet, the thing that I have not seen discussed is that the human mic actually audibilizes consensus and dissensus in a crowd without strife or even the necessity for every individual to speak. It makes audible even the people who are usually silent listeners. How is that so? Uh, this is the thing I have not seen talked about because when people don't like what's being said, they start to trail off. They stop repeating. You know, and when the crazy person gets up, or at least the person whose argument ceases to be appealing in a broad way, you can hear the audience kind of say, eh. <laughs> it certainly happens with people who are offensive or go on too long, but it also expresses people's actual relation to whatever is being offered as they repeat it and think it through in very subtle ways. And this, I think, is quite interesting. The populace withdraws support, in effect, from the words that are being said by one of its members. They begin to disobey, or just not to repeat, not to do it. And the speaker will try to recall them with a mic check, but if it doesn't take hold, someone else uh, will undertake to speak, or a mic check will come from a different part of the crowd or the group, from another region, as it were, of this speaking space. Well, suppose that what we fear day to day is that people will unthinkingly repeat what they are told. One alternative is to make sure that they do not repeat, they always have to say something independent, original, and authentic. This is the model we work in. And this has led, at its extreme, to certain defects that we can all name. But another alternative is that they thinkingly repeat, which is what I would say the human mic achieved. And insofar as the human mic did, another thing people want to talk about, ultimately derived in some odd way from hip-hop. It was very clear, I think, in the park that when people said, Mike Jack, Mike Jack, it was clear you were hearing, you know, like Tribe Called Quest in your head, right? You know, Mike, Mike Phone Check 1, 2, what is this? The five-foot assassin with the roughneck business, you know. You know. Um, that in fact there was a kind of deep crossover between uh, our aesthetic life and indeed the popular lyrics we hear in our head all the time, and what turned out to be, a, a, if not a revolutionary, then certainly a new uh, political technique. The second feature in Occupy was the extensive, nearly uh, compulsive seeming self-photography of all of the people who were protesting. Um, I remember in one of the early weeks, a friend turned to me and said, I love these people, I admire this protest, but I really wish they would put down the damn cameras and concentrate. But one would no longer say that, I think, as the weeks went on. I think my friend uh, would agree. Because a certain kind of self-photography, like the documentation of signs, such that individual slogans would go out over the internet, and if they liked, be repeated. And suddenly the next you know, day, you would see someone else writing 
the same original slogan on a sign of their own back at the park. This became a kind of extended protest, a speech that undertook collective thinking over time and over distance, not to aggrandize it, but here the protest pictures emulated and repeated other protest pictures, often from just a day before or a week before. And the purely individual signs seem to emulate other purely individual signs. There is a play of originality and repetition, as there is between any original unsigned speech and its mysterious transformation into a slogan. You could see, in space and time, how unauthored folk production actually works. You know, the kind that we associate with older folk arts or the blues and so forth and how it happens in the space of the political. And insofar as politics is neither about pure innovation and individual originality, and is also not about just being uh, led by a candidate and assenting or voting, uh, the political has to occupy some space in between. And somehow it seemed, with Occupy, that space in the middle was being created precisely because of the trivia of popular culture on one side and internet culture on the other, uh, with elements that I think have to be thought of as, as woven in from top to bottom with the aesthetic. I'll end there. Thank you. Okay, so uh, is there... We have time for questions. Call on people because sometimes I can't see as well. Well, it's pretty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, one here. yeah, I was wondering if what you're describing is emulation, if it could be simulation, and then maybe be unsatisfying or ultimately frustrating and alienating, I guess. And when you think of simulation rather than emulation, I wondered if, if there would be a Baudrillardian <laughs> moment. Are you, are, tell, me what, tell me what you're concerned about. Otherwise, I will tell you what yeah, I imagine you're concerned about. Yeah, but, yeah, kind of, yeah. Um, but, uh, but, uh, um, that much of the sort of aesthetic experience you're describing, especially if we're looking at the internet, there's a, a level of simulation and of distance, even if you're pretending to be a rock star. It constrains you, and you, you know that there's a distance. And that ultimately, this is um, uh, a narrow aesthetic and can increase alienation and the negative political effects. Are political effects different from what you're, yeah. you're seeking? Um, yeah, I, I, um, I think I agree. Let me see if this is an answer that's initially satisfying. I'll think of another. I mean, it should be said that um, I do in many ways believe the critique of the image, right? Uh, a critique of, of um, the simulation, uh, the supposed representation that has no original, that merely becomes a kind of a signifier moving between mirrors, a, a, a kind of uh, function which has no actual um, possibility of, of test or, or kind of criteria behind it. I do believe that. Um, and it seems to me what's necessary, um, rather than uh, falling into this sphere of you know, the endless recession of simulacra, uh, kind of mirroring without any ultimate ground, is to say that, curiously, there are still spaces where people are able to take up the same tools that produce these kinds of effects, right? De-realizing effects. And they manage to turn them to quite ordinary, even banal purposes. Uh, and that somehow those things, especially when they then recover some quite ordinary daily ground, that is to say, when you can kind of figure out what sort of person's bedroom this photograph, <laughs> I don't know why I'm an artist who's on my brain. You know, what, in what sort of person's room this naked photograph was taken, right? And you're suddenly carried into something that feels like a social reality, where the, the different markers are not merely the intended things traveling over the internet, often with the intervention of marketers, but all the things that they failed to erase or forgot were there, that actually allows you to see into social conditions that otherwise aren't represented. Those are, those are I guess, the moments that interest me. Um, and often people find this uh, over-optimistic, at least. They're like, what if you're being fooled? You know, there too, that there is, in fact, you can't see into these pictures. They're fully managed. Uh, I don't, I don't really believe that. Um, and so I guess, uh, insofar as there is a concern about a world of pure simulation, it's real, 
I take it that um, insofar as there are still human beings somehow in the system as points of grit, not just robots, that they do have this strange propensity to turn the most highly technological things back to the most basic kind of kitchen, bathroom, and backyard activities. And, um, and that's what really interests me. And I think it has effects that, that we find. Good. Alex, go ahead. Yeah. Um, just now at the end when you were kind of uh, talking about, uh, or, or kind of showing the benefits of, of this kind of emulation, um, it, it started to occur to me that I wonder if, if, if this quest for uh, authenticity and, and, and kind of individuality isn't in some ways the aberration of the human experience rather than that this emulation is in some ways something new. Uh, because prior to the Enlightenment, the printing press, in some ways, that's how knowledge and art was uh, communicated to some way, to some degree, emulation, uh, learning from a master, then doing the same thing at some point, maybe finding your own voice, um, or oral history and all these things. And, and in outside Western culture, that there's in some ways that is still much stronger than Western culture. So in some ways, aren't we kind of returning to a more, uh, yeah, I don't know, natural kind of human experience? Or certainly, I mean, yeah, I think that's absolutely, it's absolutely true. And, you know, another way, the way that I, I tend to think about it is to say that we did witness, we still live in a kind of modern unfolding, something that comes after the Enlightenment. And certainly in the arts, it becomes very clear. You know, in a, from a certain period of the 19th century in Paris, you get the vision that actually art is no longer an academy practice of learning to depict well, um, but suddenly a practice of destroying every previous art form by coming up with a new. But of course, I mean, it, it's, um, it's kind of a nice thing in a way to be alive now. There are other bad things about being alive now, but so many great ones that um, it really reached its end peculiarly. I don't know if this has been fully assimilated. Some people uh, clearly feel very strongly that it has. But the progress of the modern arts really ended, I think, in the 1980s. That is to say, its progressive unfolding of each move in the game, you know, making impossible all previous moves in the game, they ran out of the moves in the game. Um, and in the 80s, I think this was, you know, if you think of minimalism, uh, photorealism, painting, all kinds of things. You know, this, to me, as I remember it, was closely tied to the expectation that, of course, the entire world was going to be destroyed by nuclear weapons. So it wouldn't matter so much, actually, that you were done, you know? You would just have these, like, pieces of music that just went, cree, 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 for an hour, over and over, but we wouldn't live to suffer them for very long. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, the reality is the nuclear threat was diffused. Uh, and people were briefly very troubled by the sense that post-modernity um, was actually going to require people to live with this stuff, live in the Bonaventure Hotel forever. Um, and it has turned out, I think, in key ways not to be true. That is to say, we live in a moment where people have realized that they are going to have to live with whatever aesthetic regime we're in, and, um, and I guess look for the parts that continue to interest them. Uh, but once you step outside of that narrow framework, yes, of modernity, you have to acknowledge that there have always been longer um, art practices, certainly, which were quite different. And you see their traces even in early modern aesthetics. I mean, I think it's important that, you know, we don't think of Adam Smith as a kind of thinker on the aesthetic, but Smith and Burke and so forth are preoccupied with what it is about the theater and also what it is about actually public executions and various dramas of people before the crowd that makes others identify. You know, and they, very, they have a very strong sense that there is a kind of emulative basis to human behavior. Similarly, I also don't like to um, have recourse to uh, like neuroscience, as people often do. But it has been hard not to notice that uh, close friends who do very strongly believe in, in, and even work on such things have, keep telling me about these um, fabled mirror neurons. Uh, that have supposedly been discovered or perhaps identified or whatever. What does seem to be true, uh, since so many of these studies are just about like which parts of monkeys' brains light up um, when certain things happen, it does seem to be reliably true, and this is really interesting, that um, if a monkey uh, plugged into a giant machine watches <coughs> another monkey reaching for a banana, the first monkey's brain areas associated with reaching for a banana and eating will also light up. Right? And whenever I hear these stories, I get a little worried about what they actually mean and what, what happens when a brain lights up. Um, but, but nevertheless, this has been made for arguments that there is, um, if nothing else, a kind of emulative rehearsal in all of our brains when we watch another person undertake any motor action. Um, 
um, especially if there's some function desire like the noun that you want. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, yes, what you say, whether it's accomplished through nature or culture, it, it does feel as if it's fundamental and known in other places than this narrow. Your questions there are the more we get to talk about which reality television series you most <laughs> like. Um, I wonder, is there another another hard question? What is no one going to challenge me on the reality television front? This should be the moment of I mean the function of these things is they surely disagree. I have a question. Please. Um like the new reality, I don't know if it's really reality, but have you heard of um, The middle. Would you call that reality, or would you call it more of like base? Because it almost looks like they take reality and make it into a family. But to me, that's more of reality compared to Snooki or Kardashians. What is it? The middle. The middle. It is. This is what I was really hoping for. This is the best part. So what? What is the middle? The middle is. Is anybody the middle? It's a sitcom. It's a sitcom. Yeah. Well. To me, yes, I, guess, I usually look at it as, like, I compare my family to it. <laughs> because a lot of the issues that occur in it is my family, unfortunately. And so, if that, how would you um, put that into reality? Like, even though it's a sitcom. Yeah. I guess I would have to see the show. Does anyone have a show? Sorry, that's the bad answer. Oh, that's okay. Finishing one. I mean, because this is obviously it's a, a classic. Um, it's a it's not a problem at all. It's what's desirable about so many of the forms of theater or scripted work, as well as of the novel, is that people have a strong experience. That here is a fictionalized thing, which is it's just like me. This is my family, etc. And of course, this reaches across all sorts of lines. You know, there's a um, in New York. There's a famous story about uh, the correction. It's when friends and completed it and delivered it to his publisher, and the publisher gave it to the sales force. And, um, you know, it's about this, uh, I guess, Midwestern uh, Protestant family. And um, the Asian-American director of marketing came and he was like, he's like, I got to tell you, I wish you would stop giving me books all about my family. <laughs> uh, because there was some fundamental truth, you know, that crossed whatever trivial boundaries there are. But I don't know, is the show modeled on, like, reality TV stuff? I'm, no? I'm not sure if it's, like, okay. mo modeled. It's not, it's not, of course it's scripted. Yes. Like it, you can obviously tell that, but it's definitely scripted based on experiences yes. and families. It may capture then a kind of classic function. And you know, the challenge of, of art and artistic representation of that kind, the challenge then is, does one have the same experience in the face of reality television? I actually think the answer is generally no. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's not a defect of reality television, but it helps us to understand what reality television is, that it's actually not, it's not a genre concerned with identification in many ways. Occasionally it's, a, it's concerned with imagining you undertaking the same things in the same situation, that kind of identification, but I think almost always you think to yourself, boy, I would do it differently, right? Because the function is to, is to judge and watch and try to understand um, what it is that could represent an imagined you, which is quite different from being like, oh my god, that's so true. John, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Um, so you talk about the sort of worshipping of reality TV stars, and I think everyone can see this. Everyone sort of identifies with a certain show and they think really hits on what they think reality is, or uh, something they appreciate. And then I see these people go around, and myself, my friends, whatever, and it seems as if they're acting almost like they're on a show. Yes. Right? And so they start acting like their lives are as important as the people who they do see on prime time. And obviously this is not true. So I think fundamentally somewhere inside our heads we're saying that's not true and that's not going to happen because the truth is a lot of us lead, li lead lives that are pretty average, which is fine. But I've noticed then in response that there's this sort of appropriation of the mundane, of sort of these Instagramming everything and trying to make it look like an iconic photo. Because, okay, that might just be my silverware, but damn it, it's my silverware, and this is an epic moment, and it should be documented. Here it is. 
And it's sort of like this is the response to the unattainable nature of reality, TV, which can't be grasped by most people. But in response, you can sort of use social networking, Instagram, apps, and just the way that you and your friends conduct yourselves as a sort of response. <coughs> do you think that that's true? I, well, I, I do think it's a uh, fulsome account. Yes, and, and in many parts true. I guess I wonder, I wonder if the account is made even better by a kind of division of levels because as a kind of first order and a second order problem, it seems to me when I think of stars whom I actually <laughs> like or whom one likes and who we really want to emulate, Curiously, it's not Snooki or the Kardashians at all, and, um, but it's almost anyone in the Hollywood movie, actually. You don't even have to be that selective. Uh, I would be happy to be James Franco, but I would be happy to be, you know, pretty much anybody. I mean, <laughs> you know, because there's something about that kind of star system or, or film that's, um, that's interesting and different. And of course, what is odd about uh, the separation with reality TV is that when James Franco walks around, you do kind of think to yourself, there's a man who's justified, and getting everything that he has and anything he wants because he has this kind of inner glamour and presence uh, which we know is associated with acting skill but somehow goes beyond that but in a way we value right these people are our greek gods i often think this is partly why we enjoy watching their sufferings um, but uh, with the reality people one does feel there's something profoundly unjust for the stuff they get once they step out of the reality frame right they are engaged in the emulation of the real stars who belong in Hollywood, but somehow they wrongfully have been taken up into the system. And it's odd, because on the shows, I don't think you feel they're wrongfully there, because you say, well, that's right, this is the context in which what matters about these people is a kind of intensive, banal charisma, talentless charisma, that overcomes the usual bar to representation, which is you have to be a star. Um, but right, as soon as they actually receive the trappings of stardom, we load them. I mean, maybe we lose them before. Um, and so what it suggests, insofar as reality television is about watching people who have been modified by television, usually I would say it's about watching people who are modified by the fact of being on television, being filmed, right? But it actually is really also about uh, watching people whose dreams and personalities have also presumably been shaped by the desire to emulate stars, right? Um, one is always, I think, in a kind of second order universe there. It's as if the shows allow us to dwell on our own kind of condition as people who also could, could be um, represented on a reality show. And with the Facebook self-representation, it may be true that the function is we too can be reality stars, right? But I often still think, and you can hear it in what people say about you know, the video they made while they were on spring break and posted it or something. Um, I think people are still existing when they Instagram themselves in a first order religion. That is to say, uh, this is what it looks like when James Franco eats with a knife and fork. You know, that's what, that is to say, they, the opportunity is to emulate a star directly in some way. Whereas, um, I don't know, do you say to yourself, right, people still say, they're like, you know, my friends are so funny, we should totally be on a sitcom, like friends. I don't think they really said, we are so funny. They might say we should have our own reality show. Someone should follow us around. I don't think they think, I don't, I don't hear them say, you know who we're really like? The people on Jersey Shore. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's still a separation. I don't know if that, but yeah, modification. I know there's a gentleman there. I don't know. Sir. Well, this just goes back to mentioning, I haven't seen, I haven't personally seen the show like in the middle, but. I think, so I think around like 2002 is when The Office first appeared, and I know it was on British television first, yeah. but it was, it's really interesting that mockumentary style where the camera's clearly in these people's lives who are supposed to represent not, you know, they're not, they're not something idealized, they're, they're, they're real people. So it's kind of an interesting, maybe push um, progression from the reality TV show where the, you know, the camera was obviously then these people's lives back to sitcom without a laugh track. So I guess I was wondering if the middle has a laugh track, and if, you know, if it doesn't, if it's that type of, um, this is a real sitcom, if we can see a progression beyond this, um, these are real people, and back to these are real idealized people, like people that are still real, but people we still can um, look up to like the old sitcom stars. Yes. 
Uh, it's funny, I, you know, I wish I were someone who knew more about film history, but um, that's where I remember being really struck by the office, and it's, yes, this aesthetic of the mock documentary or mockumentary, right? And the transfer from, there are these mockumentaries going back to Spinal Tap, one of the greatest movies ever. Mm -hmm. yes. um, you know, that somehow continued on the small screen. The thing that really struck me after The Office was that um, it looked as if suddenly every sitcom was being shot and held as a, as a kind of mock documentary. Um, and that made me wonder if the line was not just from reality TV, although it's certainly true there's a tight tie because of the um, use in common of the uh, look into the camera one-on-one -on -one representation of what people are thinking and feeling, which is a feature of some documentary, but actually not a lot, not all, not a lot. I wondered if, um, if we were seeing essentially documentary creep, because in the film world, I wonder what you would say if you compared it to the past, it does seem striking that um, major, major direction, directors of fiction work seem to be making documentaries with more frequency, even exclusively, right, so that someone like Herzog is never going to make another Fitzcarraldo, but he is going to keep making um, documentaries. Uh, and also, it seems, again, anecdotally true that large numbers of people who never would have had anything to do with film, they might very well be writers, actually, or journalists in another era, are making documentaries. And so I had wondered if the, if the sense was that scripted television in the face of reality television, or just on its own, was somehow being documentarized in its formal techniques, even though it's still just a sitcom. Um, I don't know, it's a really good question. Really good question. Um. Oh, I was just going to say, I was um, just surprised by the notion that people might want to emulate reality television shows. I guess I thought the, the um, cheap thrill of reality television was getting to look at it and say, at least I'm not as despicable as those people, or as pathetic as those people, or as yes. shallow as those people, or as miserable as those people, or as as grasping as those people. I I had not actually seen, and maybe this has to do with me yet. No, no. Seen the wrong reality. No, no. Uh, seen the wrong reality. <laughs> no, no, no. You're exactly right. Yeah. Plenty of time. To mm. Anyway. You're, no, you're exactly right. I mean, I, I clearly misspoke. I mean, this has come up. It's true. People. Have, yeah, um, for me, it should be said, um, I don't think anyone emulates reality television. This, this I, I believe, is the function of judgment is somehow, and usually a, a somewhat negative judgment on people is the feature of reality shows. Uh, rather, I was, yeah, I must have not made the, the switch well. Um, it seems to me that uh, emulation belongs to our relation to stars uh, when it comes to persons, either Hollywood or in music, and then there are other interesting kind of aesthetic objects of emulation, re-singing and re-voicing and so forth. But um, it is curious when, as has happened more and more with so-called celeb reality, uh, when people who are stars, ostensibly, are brought onto a reality show, right? So that if I, uh, if I outed myself as a, a Jim Morrison fan, you know, and everyone knows the Doors were the most juvenile of groups, and that it has stayed with me even into my adulthood. Um, you know, if you were to bring Jim Morrison back from the dead and onto a reality show, his star would, I think, very quickly lose its luster. And uh, you know, it's certainly the case that, I mean, was Tommy Lee uh, ever a real star? Some of the people on Celeb Reality, I think, had some stardom. And of course, the experience of watching them on a reality show is to instantly recognize that, oh my god, how could I ever have wanted to be that person? That person is a vile, vile person. The yeah. other thing I wanted to say is that it was interesting, the fact that you thought, um, the young woman thought that the sitcom mm. captured her family better than mm. reality TV, I think shows again that, in fact, art does a better job of portraying the essence of things that reality TV is people who don't really know, know how to express what there is most to express about themselves or their situation. It's, it's, it's not, it's not, well done. It, it's the easy, it's like the easy, quick answer that somebody would come up with something to something. Okay. And what it's you say. It's the trite answer, it's the quick yeah. answer, it's the shallow answer, it's the how are you, I'm fine, thank you answer, only in this case it's, it's I'm wild and crazy or whatever. Yes. But, um, wild and so that it does in, indeed get to the reality less well than what is in fact intended to be fixed. I think that's right. And I think very good for my theory. Because it does turn out to be the case that, yeah, Art 
Art accomplishes depth, expression, the functions of sympathy, and a kind of identification and privacy. That is to say, you're able to recognize the things that are true. What the thing that I wanted to argue for is that many of these um, seemingly trivial or unesthetic kind of marginal genres, they actually do accomplish separate functions, like judgment for reality television, like a certain kind of testing process and self-creation in popular music, even though your reaction to popular music is never, oh, that's so true. It's something else. The kind of the peculiar slogans which move in popular music, I think, have a different function. Um, but I wanted to argue that rather than saying this is just the kind of effluvia of a culture of decline, or these are, you know, these things are, are to be put aside, that in fact there are characteristic faculties which are interesting to us in those different um, other uh, modes, and also that the experience of uh, encountering them and undertaking those kinds of faculties of mind also have to be identified as aesthetic. It doesn't make sense to say, there's art and it does this set of things, and then there are all these other representations, and they do different things, and therefore they're, they're not aesthetic. It seems to me insofar as, as the aesthetic or aesthesis is going to describe for us perceptions that are freighted with emotion, and as a consequence, allow um, different kinds of, kind of self-making and self-transformation that those things must be included too, even if the emotions are frequently um, emotions of anger, or rejection, comparison, judgment. And judgment is not an emotion per se, but yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question about a book, if that's okay. Great, please. Um, I was wondering if you had an opinion about David Shields' reality hunger, yes. the argument that the novel was exhausted because people didn't want to read about things that were just made up. Yes. Uh, yes. I'm glad you asked, but also not glad you asked. <laughs> uh, I feel it is, it is wrong to speak ill of a, of a sincere work. Um, I mean, I think that book was sincere, and I think um, it's a very interesting book. Uh, to me, because, and maybe, and you know, uh, this will be most fair. Maybe it's good to say, you know, I have my own view, therefore I'm a rival, and no doubt this comes from a place of envy or jealousy or something. But I have to say, the Shields book was very striking to me because I think on the first page, um, the book actually is able to identify so many of the things that seem characteristic of this moment and unexplained. That is to say, and it's very interesting that he does, he gets both sides. That is to say, he says, we seem to live in a moment of the memoir. We seem to live in a moment where people are more interested in something that feels like a direct presentation of reality rather than art, right? And he also says, and we exist in a moment of sampling and repetition. And you know, he's very interested in, in um, quotation without attribution and sampling and so forth. And he sees, he's like, and these two things are connected. And we are living in a moment of this. And then it seems to me for the rest of the book, there is no, I mean, there's no explanation actually ever accomplished um, for what this problem is or what's there, just a kind of symptomatic acting out of it. So there are lots of quotations, you know, that are not um, not sourced, and you're like, oh, thanks, you know, but they, thank you for quoting Thoreau. It does, <laughs> it's not, it did not accomplish an explanatory function, um, and therefore, and similarly, I think, uh, I guess, to me, this the line, the the, the kind of argument that. that you identify that uh, fiction loses place because of this new insatiable desire for the real. Um, it, ex it explains very little and as a consequence probably, or maybe the other way around, it may not be explaining a, an entirely real or robust phenomenon and then also doesn't explain it. In that um, it's not the case that we have lost the novel. It's not the case that we've lost the novel is still our preeminent a place to go to do certain kinds of things, right? Uh, for certain kinds of the self-transformation and the life transformation that can only be accomplished in art, it does seem to be the case um, that the kind of cultural status or value of the novel as the place to go for that and something you would actually do a lot in your life, or at least ought to, that has declined, right? it seems to me quite clearly. And, um, and also, the other thing that has declined is the confidence of novelists <coughs> at least in their public statements about what it means to be a novelist in 1960, 1970, to the present, about um, a kind of rivalry with reality. And you know, this is, I think this is now the strain that you can start to see and pull out if you go back to 
you know, Philip Roth statements in the 60s or Mailer statements about why it's hard to write meaningful fiction now. Uh, and their sense, you know, Roth says, he's like, the problem is you're competing with an American reality that is so outlandish and all these things that, you know, talking about, I think about murders or I forget what, um, but this kind of line. And I think many, I certainly did, uh, the first time I encountered that, many readers, I think, misunderstood it in that, um, maybe Roth too, you read it as if the issue is other media that are competing often, I think, when you read those essays and many others, John Barth on the literature of exhaustion. Um, that it's the fact of the newspaper, the live television itself, the fact itself of those things that makes it hard to write. And uh, from this vantage point, I don't think that's actually the, the thing that he's knowing they're not kind of picking out. It seems to be that there's competition from another function in the culture that interrupts art, um, which doesn't give people the same things as the novel, but which they are willing to give an enormous amount of time to. Um, and maybe more and more time to, and that's this, this question of kind of the event, where you could go to the place and, and see where the murder transpired or occurred. Um, but I don't think that. All right, I think we uh, probably right. should end here. It's 7 o'clock and we have to be out of here. Um, if you have maybe another question out in the foyer, uh, I'm sure Mark would be happy to talk with you. But thank you very much for coming. And <laughs>